You know, when you visit a doctor because you're sick and he looks at the symptoms, if he only just treats the symptoms and not the sickness itself, then you're still going to have those symptoms and the sickness is not going to go away. You know, in a way it's like that with our culture. As we look at these symptoms in our culture, abortion, homosexual behavior, euthanasia, suicide, uh, school violence, there is a connection between them and the influence of Darwinian evolution throughout the culture. Evolution is not responsible for abortion. Evolution is not responsible for the gay marriage issue. It's sin. Sin is the real issue. Sin is the problem. But here's what we have to understand. We live in an era of history in which people are so convinced that Darwinian evolution is true, that millions of years is true, that therefore you can't trust the Bible. And the more they believe that the Bible is not the absolute authority and it's man who determines truth, the more we believe we're just an animal and we can explain everything by natural processes, then who determines right and wrong? Well, we do. The more that Darwinian evolution, the more that the idea of millions of years, the more that, no, we can't trust the Bible, we can't believe what the Bible says in Genesis, the Bible is not the absolute authority, the more that that idea pervades the culture, the more we'll see the Christian morality collapsing, the more we'll see the Christian structure collapsing all around us, the more we'll see an increase in a moral relativism. That is, that everyone does what is right in his own eyes. So that's the connection between Darwinian evolution and the moral collapse that we see in our culture. I wanted to remind you that, you know, when you think about the life of Charles Darwin, I want you to think about Psalm 11.3. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? See, if you take a typical American house, uh, maybe that's not a typical American house, but uh, <laughs> if you take a typical American, actually, if you take a house in California, what we're worried about, that a typical house in California will look like that after the big earthquake, right? Worried about earthquakes in California. What do you know about an earthquake? If it hits the foundation, what happens to the structure? it'll collapse. Now here's what I want us to understand. The book of Genesis in the Bible is like a foundation and the rest of the Bible is like the structure. And if you take out that foundation, then the structure will collapse. And I want to give you a specific example here. I was over in uh, England uh, not that long ago and I was able to speak at a school, equivalent of a public school or government school. Uh, they call them over there in, in, in England, a public school in America. And I spoke in the science classes and then I was asked to go and speak to the Christian group. And as I was on my way up to speak to the Christian group in the school, one of the students tugged at my shirt sleeve and he said, Mr. Ham, Mr. Ham, I want to warn you about something. What's that? Well, the teacher who's the leader of this group tells us that Genesis uh, is not to be taken as literal history and it's just symbolic and things like that. And I said, oh, thank you for telling me that. I've never heard anyone believe that before. Uh, <laughs> of course, I've heard that many, many times. Um, but anyway, I was ready for that. I sort of expected that anyway. And so I, I, I get up there and I spoke to the group and then we had question time. And then during the question time, the teacher put a hand up and I thought, oh, here we go. And the teacher put a hand up and said, Mr. Ham, uh, I've told these students that we don't need to take Genesis as literal history. After all, Genesis could just be symbolic. Uh, what do you think of that? So I looked at her and I said, you know, I have a real problem with that if you say Genesis is just symbolic. And can, can I share with you why I have a problem with that? And she said, well, yeah. I mean, what else could she say? She had to, had to let me do that. She asked the question. I said, well, you know, for instance, in the New Testament, when Jesus is asked about marriage, he immediately quotes from Genesis and said, have you not read he which made in the beginning made the male and female and said, this is a reason, this is a cause, that a man leaves his father and mother, cleaves unto his wife to be one flesh. You see, Jesus was quoting directly from Genesis to build a foundation of marriage. And he was uh, actually uh, explaining here that uh, the creation of Adam and Eve, man and woman, that's why marriage is to be a man and a woman. Of course, if it's just symbolic, then maybe it just means two. And I said, and, and then we have this problem too, because if you believe in evolution and you believe that the woman came from an ape woman, like Lucy, say in the London Natural History Museum, 
and uh, you believe uh, therefore that uh, the woman came from some ape-like ancestor and didn't come from the man, you destroyed the whole basis of one flesh, then you destroyed the whole basis of marriage. And I said, then I have these other problems. For instance, in the New Testament, Romans 5, uh, Paul talks about by one man sin into the world and death through sin. Of course, if, uh, if Genesis is just symbolic and sin is just symbolic and we're all descendants of a symbol and sin is just a symbol, I'm not sure what it makes us if we're all descendants of a symbol. And what does that make, make us as sinners and what is sin if it's just a symbol anyway? And then, you know, Paul talks about, for instance, the last Adam, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it takes the place of the first Adam because the first Adam is just a symbol. Then by all logic, maybe the last Adam is just a symbol. Symbol, and then what he did on the cross was just uh, symbolic anyway. And then again, you know, if that's just symbolic, we've got a problem because Paul says in Corinthians, if Christ be not raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. And so can you see why I have a problem here? <laughs> and there was just silence in the room. Nobody said anything. Because do you realize what Jesus was saying there in Matthew 19 was that doctrine of marriage is founded in Genesis. The literal history in Genesis is foundational to the doctrine of marriage. It's meaning to be one man for one woman, not two men, not two women, one man for one woman. You become one because you're one flesh. I mean, that whole doctrine is dependent upon that history being true. But do you realize it's not just marriage? Do you realize ultimately every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11? And so can you see why I use that verse, Psalm 11.3? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you, if you take out that foundational history out of the Bible, and you say Genesis 1 to 11 is not history and that foundation doesn't matter, then really the rest collapses, just like an earthquake in California that could bring down a house. Really, not believing Genesis 1 to 11 as real history is like an earthquake that hits the Bible and takes out that foundation, and so the rest of the structure will collapse. And friends, here's the thing. You know, it's interesting. 22 years ago when I came to America, America is much more Christian than it is today. Much more Christian. And we're seeing the decline of Christianity in America, but we've seen the decline of Christianity right across our Western world. Our Western world was much more Christian in the past than it is now. Uh, I'll give you some examples. For instance, I've been over to England uh, quite a number of times and been across Europe and preached across Europe. Europe uh, the United Kingdom, it's basically spiritually dead. And, and Europe is, I mean, it is terrible. And, and when you're over there, you see, there used to be lots of churches, but no longer. The churches have been converted into all sorts of different things. There was an interesting statement from a news source in the United Kingdom. It said, Holy Week has begun with an expert prediction that Christian church in this country will be dead and buried within 40 years. It'll vanish from the mainstream British life with only 0.5% of the population attending Sunday services of any denomination. And uh, then it went on to say this, only 7.5% of the population went to church on Sundays. In the past 10 years, billed by the churches, notice this, as a decade of evangelism. When they supposedly had all this evangelism, church attendance has dropped by an alarming 22%. Uh, Another news source, in 2004, made this comment. Attendance at Britain's mosque has outstripped the number of regular worshippers in the Church of England for the first time. There's no doubt that there's a big problem in the church across the United Kingdom uh, as it has been right across Europe. It was interesting when I was uh, near Westminster Abbey one day, I was walking around that whole area and I happened to see an office and it had this sign, if you look at the second line there, the Advisory Board for Redundant Churches. <laughs> Who would have ever thought they'd have such uh, an office? By the way, I suggest you, we might have to have that sort of office very soon in uh, the country of the United States of America because I believe we're starting to see the same sorts of things happening. For instance, I've heard of some of the same sorts of things happening in the New England states as we see happening all across Europe and uh, across the United Kingdom. And let me show you what is happening. For instance, in uh, 2002, uh, in Australia, a professor made this statement in the press, within the next 10 to 20 years, most of the mainline churches will be appropriately down on their knees praying for their own survival. And, you know, even here in America, George Barner and others have done much research. And one of the statistics that George Barner came up with was this. Of those students from church homes that go to public schools or the government schools, and that's about 90% of students from church homes, by the way, that go to the government school system, about 70% of them are going to walk away from the church. Some statistics even indicate it's much higher than that. But regardless, we know that there is a major problem. We see the structure of Christianity collapsing even in this once great Christian nation of the United States of America. And so we have to ask ourselves a question. Why? What has happened across Europe? What has happened across England?
United Kingdom. What is happening in America? America is not the nation it once used to be. Can you imagine uh, if you went back 40, 50 years and said abortion will be legalized in America? If you went back to the people living in this nation 40, 50 years ago and said in the 21st century abortion will be legalized and gay marriage will be legalized and they'll be taking nativity scenes out of public places and they'll be throwing Christ out of Christmas and they've thrown God out of the public schools. I think 40, 50 years ago people would have said, no, that'll never happen in America. Oh, but it has happened in America. And it's interesting, over 22 years ago, when I first started coming to America, I was calling the church in America back to the authority of the Word of God, saying, if you don't stand on the authority of God's Word, beginning in Genesis, you're going to see this structure collapse more and more. And we've seen that structure collapse here in this great nation. And, you know, really, the Bible has a warning for us concerning these things to help us understand what has happened, why it's happened, but it should have been a warning for us to make sure it didn't happen. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, Paul has a warning for us, and I'll paraphrase it this way. Paul says, I want to warn you that Satan's going to use the same method on you as he did on Eve to get you to a position of not believing the things of God, not believing the Word of God. And so we go back to the book of Genesis, and we go back to Genesis chapter 2, first of all, where God told Adam that he could eat of all the trees, there's only one tree he wasn't to eat of, or he would die. It was a test of obedience. Now we read in Genesis chapter 3 that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, did God really say? What happened back there at the beginning? The Word of God came under attack. You see, the temptation to Eve and to Adam was this. You don't have to believe the Word of God. You don't have to take God's Word as it's been given to you. You can reinterpret it. You can decide truth for yourself. And we need to understand that the attack right from the beginning has been on the Word of God. And that attack has not changed. That attack has been the same down through the ages. God's Word has always been under attack. But in different eras of history, that attack manifests itself in very different ways. For instance, if you went back to the time of uh, Peter and Paul, do you think when Peter and Paul were preaching, somebody would have put their hand up and said, hey, excuse me, Peter, ex or excuse me, Paul, you're talking about this stuff about Jesus and the resurrection, and, but I want to know something. What? What about carbon dating? Well, no, because carbon dating is a 20th century invention. They knew nothing about carbon dating. Now, they had to deal with all sorts of attacks on the Word of God and unbelief and heresies like Gnosticism and so on, but they didn't have to deal with carbon dating. What about Martin Luther, the great reformer? Do you think when he was nailing those theses on the door of the church, somebody came to him and said, Hey, Dr. Luther, what, what, what are you doing there? And this stuff about, you know, salvation by faith that you're talking about and so on. Wait, 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 wait. I want to know, what do you do with dinosaurs and how did Noah get the animals on the ark? See, there weren't issues in his day. He didn't have to deal with those issues. Do you think anyone came up to Wesley and said, Hey, Wesley, I want to know, how did, how did the Grand Canyon form? Because I'm told it takes millions of years. No, that, he didn't know about those sorts of things. That wasn't an issue in his day. But it is an issue in our day. We live in an era of history called a scientific age. And in this era of history, there's a particular attack on the Word of God. It's still an attack on the Word of God, just as it was in Luther's day, just as it was in Peter and Paul's day, just as it was in the days of the Israelites when, when God's Word was attacked, just as it was back there in Genesis chapter 3. It's the same attack. It's the attack on God's Word. But in this era of history, the attack really has focused on God's Word in Genesis chapters 1 to 11. Because of the teaching of millions of years in particular and also Darwinian evolution, it's caused many people to start asking those questions. Did God really say six days? Did God really say global flood? Did God really say he took dust and made a man and took his side and made a woman? Did God really say there was a literal Adam and a literal Eve? And what's happened is whole generations, even from the church, have started to question Genesis 1 to 11 and because they haven't been given answers by their churches uh, or by their parents even, or by their Sunday school teachers or by their pastors, because we haven't taught them the answers to defend the Christian faith, what's happened is we haven't given those answers to uh, those generations. And so they have started to question the Word of God. And that doubt, just like with Eve, has led to unbelief. And now we see droves of them just walking away from the church. One of my favorite preachers of all times is Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, back in the, the 50s in England, 
uh, was an incredible expositional preacher, verse by verse through scripture. And I love uh, the material of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of his sermons said this, if you read the history of the church and look at these periods of declension when the church was moribund and did not seem to count at all, you'll find that without a single exception, the thing that has most characterized the life of the church at such a time has been either a denial or else a concealing or else a neglect of certain vital truths which are essential to the whole Christian position. And I believe that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones has hit it right on the head. And we live in an era of history in which there has been a neglect. There, there's been a neglect of an essential, vital truth to Christianity, not just an, a neglect. Uh, it's actually been a denial of it. And it concerns the book of Genesis. And it really is summed up, I believe, by Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 3 and verse 12, where speaking to Nicodemus about being born again, he said, Nicodemus, if I tell you about earthly things and you don't believe them, how are you going to believe when I tell you about heavenly things? And I want to apply that practically for you here and apply it in this era of history in a particular way. In the late 18th century, early 19th century, when the idea of millions of years started to be popularized. You see, at that time, uh, most people in the church believed that God created just uh, uh, thousands of years ago. There was a global flood and, you know, that's where most of your fossils come from. The earth is very young. God created in six days. But certain deists and materialists who did not believe the Bible, did not want people to believe in the Bible, wanted a so-called scientific justification for not believing the Bible, popularized the idea that the layers of rock with the fossils took millions of years to get there. Dr. Terry Mortensen from Answers in Genesis, who has a PhD in the history of geology, calls it the great turning point. Because what happened then was, sadly, that there were uh, many theologians, uh, there were many uh, church leaders uh, who actually adopted the idea of millions of years, added it into the Bible and started reinterpreting the days of creation and started reinterpreting the flood and so on. Actually, I want you to think about it. It was a great turning point because what they started to do they started to take man's fallible ideas about the age of the earth, man who wasn't there, who didn't see all that happen, who's interpreted geology in the present in a particular way and has taken it to God's word and started to reinterpret the clear teaching of the Bible in regard to the days of creation, in regard to the flood. It was really a Genesis 3 attack. Did God really say? And then Charles Darwin built on that. Charles Darwin took those books of, of Charles Lyell on board the Beagle, those books that popularize the idea of millions of years. And basically, you could sum it up this way. If there's millions of years in geology, and you apply that to biology, and as Darwin developed his ideas after he uh, sailed on the Beagle and later on and wrote his book and so on, it's basically given all that time, then all these little changes you see in animals and plants, given enough time, one kind of animal will change into another kind. And then, of course, he published his famous book, The Origin of the Species, in 1859. And 12 years later, he published that book called The Descent of Man, as he popularized the idea that one kind of animal changed into another, ape-like creatures into people. It was another Genesis 3 attack, because you know what happened? Much of the church took his ideas and said, well, as well as millions of years, now we can take Darwin's ideas and add them to the Bible and reinterpret the account of Adam and Eve. And you start to see why that teacher in England said to me, well, Genesis is just symbolic. Because if evolution is true and millions of years is true, how can you believe Genesis? That's what she's really saying. How can you take that as written? You know, when I was at Down House, Darwin's house there in Kent in England, and went through, one of the exhibits actually said this. Talking about, you know, reference to people who believed in creation and so on, the exhibit said, Every living creature looked the way it did because God had designed it that way in reference to, to people who believe the Bible and so on. Darwin's theory made nonsense of all of this. You see, what they're saying is Darwin's theory made nonsense of the idea that God created, that there's design because of God. You see, Darwin's Genesis 3 attack was to say, you don't have to take Genesis literally. That history is not true. It was a Genesis 3 attack creating doubt in regard to the Word of God. And see, that's the point I want to get to, uh, to us. And that is, the real issue in regard to Darwin's work and Darwin's influence and the millions of years and so on, it really comes down to an issue of biblical authority.
can we or can we not take God's Word as written in Genesis, as Paul did, as Jesus did, or do we take man's ideas, reinterpret the Bible, and say it's really not the absolute authority and we really can't trust it? I mean, that's what the issue is all about. That's the fundamental issue. And I want to show you what happened as Darwin's ideas spread around the world. Let's look at Darwin's influence on the secularists. A very famous man that lived at the time of Darwin was a man called Thomas Huxley. In fact, his grandson, uh, Julian Huxley, at the Darwinian Centennial Convention in Chicago, talked about the fact that because of Darwinian evolution, now we've done away with any need for belief in supernatural. Now we know that everything happened by natural processes. It's interesting to note that Thomas Huxley, who called himself Darwin's bulldog at one particular stage in history, because he really popularized Darwinian evolution, actually did a series of lectures. And in that series of lectures, uh, they were put together in a book called Science and the Hebrew Tradition. And he was giving that series of lectures even in America. And throughout that series, it was fascinating to see how he viewed clergy who agreed with evolution. You see, the whole emphasis through that series of lectures was this. He was challenging the clergy. He was saying to them, now, you're rejecting a global flood because of the millions of years, and you're rejecting a literal Adam and Eve uh, because of evolution, and you're saying that you can't believe Genesis now uh, because of uh, evolution. And then Huxley went on and said, well, wait a minute, what are you going to do with all this New Testament teaching? What are you going to do with what Paul does in Corinthians and also in Romans, and how Paul relates the, the doctrines of Christianity back to Genesis? And what are you going to do with what, what Jesus said about the flood? And if you don't believe in a global flood and you don't believe in Genesis, then how can you believe these doctrines in the New Testament? Here was Huxley's point, because as you read through the series of lectures he gave, he then went on to say, but you're right, Genesis is not true because evolution is true. Genesis is not true because millions of years is true. You can't believe in a global flood, you can't believe in Adam and Eve. And so then he gets to the crux of it. You've got to give up the Bible totally. You've got to give up Christianity. And you know, that's how these people see uh, the teaching of evolution and teaching of millions of years. They see it as a direct attack on Christianity. And people like Huxley and his grandson, Julian Huxley, and of course many other secular humanists have used the teaching of evolution to go out to the world to say, evolution's true, millions of years is true, Genesis is not true, therefore the Bible can't be true, Christianity is not true. That's really what their agenda is. Richard Bozarth, was a writer for the American Atheist, who by the way claims he was brought up in a Christian home. And I suspect being taught evolution, not giving the answers, maybe going to a church where, the, where pastors or others compromised, wouldn't surprise me. I don't know for sure, but, but he wrote this in the American Atheist back in 1979. He said, the day will come when the evidence constantly accumulating around the evolutionary theory becomes so massively persuasive that even the last and most fundamental Christian warriors will have to lay down their arms and surrender unconditionally. I believe that day will be the end of Christianity. Notice that the, the secular humanists see evolution as a direct attack on Christianity itself. And yet, much of the church compromises with evolution? Think about that. But how do the secularists view it? They view it as an attack on the Bible, an attack on Christianity. What about Darwin's influence on racism? Well, Charles Darwin himself said, the main conclusion arrived at in this work, that's his book, The Descent of Man, namely that man is descended from some lowly organized form. Will I regret to think be highly distasteful to many, but there can hardly be doubt that we are descended from barbarians. Stephen Jay Gould, the late Stephen Jay Gould from Harvard University said this, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Don't get me wrong, evolution is not the cause of racism. Sin is the cause of racism. But if people believe in Darwin's evolutionary view that there are some groups of people that are closer to the apes than others and some are more advanced and some are, uh, are less advanced, some are primitive and, and, and so on, you can understand how that would fuel racist ideas and prejudice. Sir so Arthur Keith, famous anthropologist actually, in commenting on Hitler, uh, said this, the German Fuhrer, as I have consistently maintained, is an evolutionist. He has constantly sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. It's interesting, Sir Arthur Keith wrote a lot on, on Piltdown Man that was found out to be a fraud. Ernst Haeckel, 
As Thomas Huxley was Darwin's bulldog in England, Ernst Haeckel was, was Darwin's bulldog in Germany. And he wrote a book called The History of Creation, and he had some shocking statements in there. At the lowest stage of human mental development, the Australian Aborigines, Polynesians, Bushmen, Hottentots, Negro tribes, and so on. And uh, he makes this comment, the able missionary Morlang, who tried for many years without the slightest success to civilize the ape-like Negro tribes, says any mission to such savages is useless. They stand far below unreasoning animals. Absolutely shocking statements, but consistent with what they believed about what Darwin was teaching. And you know, many people don't realize this, but in the United States of America, back in 1914, there was a textbook used in the public schools. In fact, it was used at the time of the Scopes trial in 1925, actually. It was used in Dayton, Tennessee, in the public schools there. It was already teaching students to be racists based on Darwin's idea. For instance, here's a quote from the Civic Biology book by Hunter uh, back in 1914. Uh, used in the public schools in America. At the present time, there exist upon Earth five races, the highest type of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized and white inhabitants of Europe and America. Mm -hmm. Students in America, in the public schools, many of those students went to churches where we being taught to be racist, that the Caucasians were the highest race, based on Darwin's ideas. As I said, Darwinian evolution is not responsible for racism, but when you take his ideas and you build your thinking upon them, become consistent, and you don't build your thinking on the Bible, look what happens. What about Darwin's influence on school violence? Well, there's a connection. For instance, if we're just animals, there's no God, is there any purpose and meaning in life? What would happen to generations of school students through Europe or through America, where they're taken through an education system where we throw on God out and we tell them you're just an animal. You're a result of natural processes. In 2007, a student in Finland shot a number of people and killed them at a high school. But here's a statement from that student. He said, I am prepared to fight and die for my cause. I, as a natural selection, will eliminate all who I see unfit disgraces of the human race and failures of natural selection. No, the truth is I'm just an animal, a human, an individual, a dissident. It's time to put natural selection and survival of the fittest back on tracks. Do you know he's only being consistent with what he was taught in school? In Columbine, we've all heard of the terrible shootings there quite a number of years ago now. In the police report, they said this of one of the shooters, Harris, that he wore a black trench coat and underneath it there was a white t-shirt that said natural selection. I suggest to you that these students were just being consistent with what they were being taught. Now I'm sure that there'll be teachers and secular educators that get real upset with, with, with me making a connection between evolution and school violence, but the point is these students did themselves make that connection. Now, if you were to look at any of their textbooks, a biology textbook that talks about the origin of life, the origin of the universe, the origin of man, it explains to the students that all this happened by natural processes, that man is just an animal, that there's no supernatural involved. The processes that the poet Tennyson described, nature, red in tooth and in claw, uh, survival of the fittest, uh, the struggle for survival, as Darwin talked about. The more that a culture abandons the absolute authority of the Word of God, and the more that a culture builds its thinking on autonomous human reasoning, the more we'll see the collapse of Christian morality, and we'll see an increase in moral relativism, and eventually you'd see anarchy unless, unless there are people who can try to control society. But then it's just their opinions as to how they control it and what laws that they want to dictate. After all, really, that's what we saw happen in Hitler's Germany. And you know, Hitler was an ardent evolutionist, he used evolution to justify what he did to the Jews, the Gypsies, the form people and others. There's no doubt there's a connection between Darwinian evolution and what Hitler did. And he saw it as, we are the superior race, the Aryan race. We need to eliminate the unfit. And of course, evolution gives him that excuse in his mind, that justification in his mind to do that. What about Darwin's influence on the clergy? Wow, when Darwin introduced his ideas in England, so many of the clergy started to take his idea and say, well, we can believe in evolution, we'll just say God did it. Many of us might have heard of the term theistic evolution. A lot of clergy today would say, oh, oh we believe God used evolution. We're theistic evolutionists. But I suggest to you that such a position is a Genesis 3 attack on the foundation. Back at the time of the Scopes trial, in the transcript of the Scopes trial, there are many 
many statements by a number of clergy, such as uh, this particular one here where defence uh, attorney Arthur Hayes read this statement in as a transcript of the Scopes trial. Walter Whitaker, rector of St. John's Episcopal Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, says, as one who for 30 years has preached Jesus Christ as a son of God and as the express image of the Father, I am unable to see a contradiction between evolution and Christianity. Charles Templeton was an evangelist back in the 1950s. I've actually stood in a pulpit in Scotland where Charles Dem Templeton stood and back in the 50s and actually preached to the congregation and called them to repentance, to trust in Jesus. He was at the time of Billy Graham and he knew Billy Graham. And in his book called Farewell to God, uh, before he went to Princeton, he said this to Billy Graham. He said, in the course of a conversation, Billy, it's simply not possible any longer to believe, for instance, the biblical account of creation. The world wasn't created over a period of days a few thousand years ago. It evolved over millions of years. It's not a matter of speculation. It's demonstrable fact. He was saying, you've got to believe in evolution. He went to Princeton, was taught evolution in millions of years, which reinforced that even more. He then wrote a book called Farewell to God and walked away from the Christian faith. I don't believe he was ever a true Christian. But he said this in his book. I believe there is no supreme being with human attributes, no God in the biblical sense. Life is a result of timeless evolutionary forces, having reached its present transient state over millions of years. And you know, one of the big problems that he had was with the whole issue of death and suffering, as Darwin had. He was not taught about the fact that it's because of sin and our sin that there's death and suffering. Ted Turner, who founded CNN and TNT, as you know, he's a media giant, and look at the legacy he's left in the secular media, uh, anti-Christian media. Uh, Turner, it, it was said in this uh, uh, news item from the New York Times, is a strident non-believer says, having lost his faith after his sister died of a painful disease. I was taught that God was love and God was powerful. I, I don't know whether he's brought up in a, a church home or whatever. I suspect he probably was and, or went to church at some stage. And, and you know what we're taught in our churches? God is love. And there's this emphasis on God is love. And yet at the same time, but I'm being taught millions of years of death and struggle and suffering. And look at all the death and suffering out there. Don't worry about that. God is love. We're not giving answers. And what did Turner say? I couldn't understand how someone so innocent should be made or allowed to suffer so. You know what is sad? What is sad is that so many clergy have compromised with millions of years and, and, and evolution, compromised with Darwin's ideas, and they do this to placate the secular world and placate the secular scientists of the day. But the secular world love it when they do this because they see it as a way of helping destroy Christianity even further. It's about time the church woke up. Eugenie Scott, Dr. Eugenie Scott, who heads up an anti-creation organization in America. And she goes around lecturing against creationists and against Christianity. She's a self-professed atheist. And she said this, one of the points that I make in my public lectures is the best kept secret in this controversy is that Catholics and mainstream Protestants accept evolution as the way God did things. I found that the most effective allies for evolution are people of the faith community. One clergyman with a backward collar is worth two biologists at a school board meeting any day. Here's an atheist, a leading secular humanist in America saying, you know the best way to get Christianity out of the schools and to destroy Christianity? Use the clergyman, because most of them have compromised with millions of years. No wonder we have a problem. A student uh, wrote to me and said they went to a teaching evolution seminar led by Eugenie Scott. And he said this, an awful negative was suggested to those experiencing opposition from students. The teachers were advised by this leading atheist to suggest to the Bible believers to consult their clergy who would usually assure them that evolution, belief in evolution is okay. When, when you're a teacher and you've got kids in your classroom and they're, they're bringing up you know, creation or anti-evolution arguments or whatever, she said, the best thing to do is use the clergy to tell them they believe in evolution. That'll help us destroy Christianity. What about Darwin's influence on today's generations? You know, we live in a culture in which we have whole generations that have been told that the Bible can't be trusted because of so-called science. I remember the time that I visited a church and the youth pastor asked me if I would come and speak to the youth. And he said to me, look, you know, what, what young people today, I mean, they have such a short attention span. And he said, you know, you might be able to talk to them for five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, but..." You're not going to be able to keep them much longer than that. He said, I can't keep them any longer than that. Well, 
When I went up the front, I started to speak on this whole topic of creation, evolution, you can trust the book of Genesis, it's real history, and gave some answers concerning dinosaurs and fossils, and then opened up for questions. And the hands went up all over the room. And they were asking all sorts of questions about carbon-14 and other issues concerning the age of the Earth and the Grand Canyon and the so-called ape men and more questions about dinosaurs and the days of creation. And the questions just went on and on and on. I think I ended up talking for an hour or something like that. Well, afterwards, a youth pastor came to me and he said, what happened? I said, what do you mean? He said, I have never seen those kids ask questions like that before. I haven't been able to get them to sit more than five or ten minutes when I've tried to teach them about the Bible. And he said, you came in and suddenly they're sitting on the edge of their seats and Johnny down the front. I didn't even know he could ask a question, let alone the question he asked. And so we have generations today growing up in this world saying, well, can the Bible really be trusted in this scientific age? And they're saying, what's the church going to say about this? You know what much of the church says? Oh, don't worry about that. Trust in Jesus. And here they are asking these questions. Well, what about the millions of years? What about evolution? Oh, you can believe in that, says a lot of the church. That, that's okay. But trust in Jesus. Don't get me wrong. We want people to trust in Jesus. But the message of Jesus comes from the same book as Genesis 1 to 11. It's called the Bible. And it all claims to be the Word of God, the infallible, inerrant Word of God. Professor Wilson, E.O. Wilson, from Harvard, claims this. He said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. I don't believe he was truly a born-again Christian. But he said, when I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with a great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolutionary theory. See, the problem that we have is this. Do you realize I've found that many leading secular humanists atheists in, in, in our culture today that are fighting against Christianity were brought up in some sort of church home that went to church, went to Sunday school. And you know what I think has happened? This is what I believe has happened. Well, 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 pastor, what about the millions of years in evolution? Well, Sunday school teacher, what about the millions of years in evolution? And in many instances, oh, what the, you know, that's got nothing to do with church. That's okay. You can believe what you're taught at school, but trust in Jesus. And we teach all these wonderful Bible stories in our Sunday schools and so on. And, and, and we say, it doesn't matter about dinosaurs and millions of years. How do they all get the animals on the earth? Look, that doesn't matter. Genesis could just be symbolic anyway. Don't worry about that. Trust in Jesus. And you know what they start to realize? If that history in Genesis is not true, and that's recorded as the Word of God, and Paul quotes from it, and Jesus quotes from it, and it's quoted in the rest of the Bible here and there, and the whole of our doctrine is built on that, and the gospel is built on that. But if that's not true, how can any of it be true? And now here we have a professor who teaches evolution and, and, and takes an anti-Christian position. Uh, here's another example I saw in the newspaper about a Harvard senior. He's now, this person is now a director of a, a humanist group, of a secular humanist group. He's the executive director for the Center for Inquiry uh, in New York City, one of the leading skeptics groups. And he said he was an older boy in the Catholic Church, but cracks formed in his faith as his love for science grew. He had a hard time, for example, reconciling the Bible with what he'd learned about evolution. So what about Darwin's influence on the church then? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The first time I visited London in England, I wanted to visit a very famous place called Westminster Abbey. I had heard that a very famous man was buried there, because a lot of famous men are buried in Westminster Abbey, like Sir Isaac Newton, for instance. But I'd heard that Charles Darwin was actually buried in Westminster Abbey, and I wanted to go and see that for myself and uh, to see where he was buried. It was fascinating to me to walk into Westminster Abbey and ask where to find Darwin's grave. And at first I couldn't find it because I didn't realize he's buried in the floor of the church and you actually walk over and you can actually see his grave right there in front of you. And I was looking down at Darwin's grave. There's Darwin buried in the foundation of the church. Here was something that to me was actually symbolic of what Darwin has done to this world, to this era of history. A man that popularized a philosophy to destroy the foundation of the church, honored by the church and buried in the foundation of the church. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What a picture of what Darwin and his teachings have really done in this era of history.
to attack the very foundation, to attack the Word of God itself. That's what's happened to England. That's what's happened to Europe. That's what's happening in America. Because symbolically, increasingly, so much of the church in America and the Christian colleges and Bible colleges and seminaries, not all, but the majority, have buried Darwin in the foundation of their institution. Because they have accepted millions of years in evolutionary ideas, Genesis doesn't matter, reinterpret that, but trust in Jesus! And we wonder why we see darkness across Europe, across England, and increasing darkness across America. A lot of times I've had people uh, make an accusation against us, and the accusation they've made is this. They've said, so you people are saying if you don't believe in a literal Genesis, you can't be a Christian. If you don't believe in six literal days of creation, you can't be a Christian. If you believe in evolution, you can't be a Christian. I'm not saying that. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that. For instance, what does the Bible say? Well, Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, and reject evolution and believe in a young earth, you'll be saved. <laughs> Is that what the Bible says? No, the Bible doesn't say that. It says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. What saves you? It's faith in Christ that saves you, correct? The Bible never connects salvation to the age of the earth, never connects salvation to not believing in evolution, anything like that. It's faith in Christ. And people say, so, so it doesn't matter then whether you believe in evolution or millions of years. I didn't say that. I didn't say it doesn't matter. See, if you were a born-again Christian, you would believe that Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead. Is that correct? Let me ask you a question. How do you know that Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead? Were you there? How do you know? Because of? Oh, you take the Bible as written. You take it as the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. That this is God's word to us, as it claims, and, and you take it as written. If it's history, it's history. And Oh, I see. So you probably believe that a fish swallowed a man. Do you actually believe a fish swallowed a man? A man called Jonah? How do you know that? Because the Bible says so. Oh, I see. And then you go to the majority of churches around our world, across America, across Europe, England, theological colleges, Bible colleges, seminaries, and you're saying, now in Genesis, it says six days and global flood and death after sin, and it's, oh, well, no, well, we're not sure about that. Well, you don't have to worry about that. Well, well you believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Well, yeah, a lot of them will say, yeah. And you even believe in, in, in Jonah being swallowed by a fish, and a lot of them will even say, well, yeah, but in Genesis, it says six days and global flood and death after sin. Well, we're not, well, we don't, don't really believe that. And Well, what, millions of years and evolution. And, do you realize what's happening? When the church adopted millions of years and evolutionary ideas into the Bible, when they adopted that into the Bible and reinterpreted the days, reinterpreted the flood, reinterpreted death, reinterpreted the account of Adam and Eve and so on, what they did was unlock a door. The door they unlocked was, you don't have to take this account of history as written. You can take man's ideas outside the Bible. You can reinterpret the Bible. They unlocked a door. It was a Genesis 3 attack on the Word of God to doubt the Word of God, not believe the Word of God. What do the next generation uh, usually do? Do they, do they push their door open further or tend to close it? Push it open further. When there's compromise in one generation, you tend to find more compromise in the next generation and the next generation until eventually what will happen? You'll lose biblical authority, the culture will change, you'll see the collapse of Christianity, and you'll see secular humanism taking over. That's exactly what's happened. Oh, how important it is for us as Christians, not to succumb to the Genesis 3 attack of our age, of our era of history. How important it is for us to recognize the Genesis 3 attack in our day, and to recognize there's been an attack on the Word of God, and so much of the church has succumbed to it. Richard Bozarth, when he wrote in The American Atheist, said this, and here's a, here's a secular humanist who's making a statement that I totally agree with 100%, but he recognizes what evolution is to Christianity. He says, Christianity is, must be totally committed to the special creation as described in Genesis, and Christianity must fight with its full might, fair or foul, against the theory of evolution. I totally agree. Christianity has to fight fair, well, <laughs> I don't know about fair or foul, but Christianity <laughs> has to fight against the theory of evolution.
Many people today, particularly our churches, they just don't realize that these young people have all these questions because of what they've been taught at school. How can the Bible be true if there was a big bang billions of years ago? Now, how can the Bible be true if it doesn't mention, or they think it doesn't mention, dinosaurs? And what about the ape men and carbon dating? It's interesting to note that wherever I travel in the world, whether it's in Christian or non-Christian circles, I get asked the same basic questions wherever I go. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer. Uh, some translations say, be prepared to give a defense. Now that word answer or defense uh, is translated from the Greek word apologia. And the word apologia really has that sense of to give an answer back, to give a defense, to give a logical reason defense of the faith. That's what it really means. We need to be prepared to give a logical reason defense of the faith, to give an answer back. One of the big problems I see in our churches, our Sunday schools, our Bible studies, even our Christian schools, even many of our home schools, our church, church homes is this. So many have been brought up in those churches and homes and seminaries and Bible colleges where Christianity has sort of been imposed from the top down, the structure of it, the message of the gospel, the doctrines, Christian morality imposed from the top down. They've been told, don't worry about Genesis, we don't need that, or millions of years evolution, you can believe in that, that doesn't matter. And what's happened? We haven't given them answers to defend their faith. And you know one of the problems I see with the church in America and why they have not been successful in dealing with the issues? They've compromised the foundation of the Word of God right there in Genesis 1 to 11. So they haven't understood the Genesis 3 attack is on the Word. The issue is that the, the authority of God's Word has been undermined in the culture and subsequent generations have given up God's Word altogether. And they've looked at the, the symptoms, the moral issues, and throwing millions of dollars at that. We've got to change the laws in regard to abortion and so on. We've tried to change the culture. The Bible doesn't say go into all the world and change the culture. The Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Do you know why the culture changed? Whole generations have been taken through a culture and education system and their foundation changed from God's word to man's word. Their hearts and minds have been changed in regard to the word of God and in regard to the Lord Jesus Christ and we've trained them to be secular humanists, and we wonder why they now have a structure of relative morality. And if we want to be successful in reaching this culture, what have we got to do? You can't change the culture from the top down. It changed from the foundation up. If you want to change it back, you've got to do it from the foundation up. It's a heart and mind issue. It's a biblical authority issue. That's what it's all about.